This is Culture Cast. I'm Nova Safo. Today, have you heard this one before? It's a story set in a dystopian world about 25 years from now. The world has kind of gone to hell. That sounds a little familiar, but there's a twist, an online debate. I was a little worried that maybe that there was this kind of, you know, guy, you know, guy versus girl thing going on, right? But I haven't really seen that. My dystopia is better than your dystopia. The book Spielberg made into a movie, and the book he didn't. That's CultureCast, coming up. CultureCast is a production of Chicago Radio Works. You can subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or the TuneIn app. You can also listen on our website, culturecast.org. Welcome to Culture Cast. I'm Nova Safo in Chicago. Have you heard of the books Warcross and Ready Player One? They're the subject of a lot of internet chatter, and not just because Steven Spielberg has turned Ready Player One into a movie. That movie comes out in March, by the way. It's been met with lots of excited anticipation from sci-fi nerds. But Spielberg has had some competition, at least for the hearts of fans. That competition, from the book Warcross, another young adult novel, It's developed a devoted following, partly because it has a lot of similarities to Ready Player One. And those similarities have led to lots of debate online about the merits of the two stories. Our CultureCast book editor, Loretta Williams, delved into that debate. She read both books, and she starts us off with Ready Player One. It's a story set in a dystopian world about 25 years from now. The world has kind of gone to hell. The energy crisis stuff finally caught up with us in theory. And and so folks like the main character, whose name is Wade Watts, he's about an 18, 17, 18 year old kid. He lives in this in something called the stacks. And the stacks you might think of as the, even the worst version of what the projects might be, because literally what they are are trailers stacked on top of one another. Hmm. And it's set sort of in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Basically, the story surrounds the fact that even though there's that world, there's also this virtual reality world that everybody is a part of, and it's called the Oasis. And everything of importance happens in the Oasis. So it's not just a gaming place, but it's also, for example, where Wade goes to school. Commerce happens there. Everything happens there. Its importance in society is that it basically is the foundation, the kind of the the matrix, if you will, that holds the society together. Oh, yes. Right. Exactly. So James Halliday, who created the the Oasis, had this sort of utopian view in mind of the world. The virtual reality world was not just a place of commerce, but, it, you know, and gaming, but it's also a place of knowledge and community and stuff, much the way that people have sort of talked about the internet. But then Halliday dies. Mm-hmm. And when he dies, he leaves behind a message. Okay. And the movie has this particular plot twist, which really sets things off. Let's take a listen. The Oasis was the brainchild of James Halliday. Hello, if you're watching this, I'm dead. I created a hidden object, an Easter egg. The first person to find the egg will inherit half a trillion dollars and total control of the Oasis itself. So in the story, what happens is there's this tension then and battle between a corporation that is pouring a lot of resources into being able to take control of the Oasis and have that money. And everyday people like Wade. And then what happens is Wade actually is the first person to find the very first key of the Easter egg. He then comes under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of attention that, you know, sort of fuels also the rest of the story. Is this one of those things where the Easter egg was inside of you, it's in your heart all along? No. (laughs) Oh, good. Because there, there might be riots. <laughs> Although there, <laughs> there is an the element that is about community a little bit. I will say that much, but I don't want to give the rest of it away. Now, the last time we talked about this book, you were just about to set out reading it. And you were going to read it in conjunction with another book called War Cross. We promised that we'd come back and talk about both these books together because there's a connection between them. But let's begin first with War Cross, the second book. To the average player, Warcross is just a game. But to a bounty hunter like me, it's about the thrill of the chase. But now I'm the target. 
And I'm learning that some games you play, others you survive. I'm a player, a hunter, and a hacker. All right, so that's the trailer for Warcross. So, Loretta, what's happening there? What's this story about? Warcross is also set in a dystopian future. It, uh, it's a little less clear to me how far in the future this is, but it is definitely a video game, virtual reality storyline. In this case, the main character is a young woman named Amika Chen. She's she's about 18. She too has, like just like in Ready Player One, she's kind of living in a slum kind of scenario. I believe the setting is New York, actually. And she works as a bounty hunter. But it's it's kind of like an extension of like the problem of the gig economy where, you know, everybody's like doing stuff, not as an employee, but as like whatever they can get when they can get it. And it's not, it's, it's another extension mm-hmm. of that problem of like, no consistent income, no other, you know, way of supporting yourself, your landlord's banging on the door because you're behind in the rent. She's also a hacker, however, and so and which is in the way in which that she is become a bounty hunter, because what she does is she tr- tries to track down people who illegally bet on the game Warcross. So Warcross, it's kind of a classic video game in that there are teams And think about any shooter kind of video game kind of thing. You're in a kind of a world that has all the various things coming at you, weird creatures, changing landscapes. It's all that. But there are these tournaments and you have to capture the other team's icon. And that's what causes you to then advance to the next team. All right. So she's happily going along doing this, uh, hacking into the game, finding people who are illegally betting on the game. Well, she goes into the virtual reality worlds around the game, but then she acts. She she does actually hack into the opening game of the Warcross Championships, only to accidentally do something and show herself. So then people are like, "What the hell are you doing in the middle of the games?" That's actually extremely illegal. Things sort of develop from there. So um, the first thing that of course jumps out is that. We have a heroine instead of a hero as yes. the, in the top of the story. So uh, other ways these stories are different or diverge? I would say that one of the things that's sort of interesting about the two worlds is some degree the point of view and and sort of the more international scope of war cross in the sense that you have you have a sense of there just of there being more people who are from different cultures and everything like that. That happened in Ready Player One too, but because Amika Chen works more in a, I want to say works more in a team. I don't know. It's funny because they both have te- and ultimately have teams, but somehow the Ready Player One is much more Wade centric, and I sort of felt like. In Warcross, we had a slightly bigger worldview. Uh, we should clarify Warcross, unlike Ready Player One, Warcross is the first of a trilogy, whether uh, as opposed to Ready Player One, which is kind of a standalone book. Right. Well, two things about that. One is that turns out Marie Lu tends to write that way. Her other books have been se- series. Now, Ready Player One, as it turns out, Ernest Klein has said he's also writing a sequel to Ready Player okay. One. But that is a more contained story. Culture Cast book editor Loretta Williams talking about both Ready Player One and Warcross. Coming up after the break, we delve into the online debate over these two books. Stick around. Culture Cast is brought to you by Millennial Hashtags. All you have to do is retweet them, and it feels like you actually did something. Millennial hashtags. Reduce everything you care about to one or two words. CultureCast is also brought to you by... Branding. We all need a brand now, just like toothpaste and laundry detergent. Because why be a person when you can be a product? Branding. It's like hashtags, but somehow worse. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Culture Cast. A reminder, like us on iTunes, spread the word, and subscribe by heading to our website, culturecast.org. We've got links to get you to our show pages on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn.
Okay, back to our conversation with CultureCast book editor Loretta Williams. We're talking about the books Ready Player One and Warcross. Fans online have been having a spirited discussion about these two books, and Loretta got pulled in through a Facebook post. What got me interested in it was, in part, a Facebook post by a friend of mine who basically sort of said, well, if you really like Ready Player One, read Warcross, (laughs) you know, and it's like, Mm -hmm. okay. (laughs) And it's not like he's not a Ready Player One fan. So that got me started on that, like, okay, so like, what's the, the implication was, was that somehow Warcross might be better, right? And what I see online in this kind of like Ready Player One versus Warcross thing is that it's mostly young women who are sticking up for Warcross. Mm. I was a little worried that maybe that there was this kind of, you know, guy versus girl thing going on. But I haven't really seen that. I just think it's the way people connect to that main character and how much that character speaks to issues in people's lives. So, you know... Ready Player One. Wade Watts is a white kid, teenager from middle America, and he lives in a crappy place, and he hopes to, like, not be living in a crappy place, but yet he's also mm-hmm. got some ethics to him. It's, it's, it's a classic, you know, little guy versus the David and Goliath kind of story in some regard, but it, it kind of speaks to some of the things that people, especially young people, I think, have to deal with now in middle America and other places. Whereas I think what happens with Warcross is that it it is very much a female perspective and it's Chinese American and it's New York. So some people are just gonna be more naturally drawn to, to that because that's more of their experience. But what happens then online is that everybody sort of probably feels like they gotta defend why they like this book and why one might be better than the other and everything like that. And I don't see either one of them as better than the other. I can see why, say for example, Warcross, I might find Warcross personally more appealing than I did Ready Player One. Some people have, so I will say one, two other things about Ready Player One though. Some people have just sort of said that as a storytelling book, Warcross is written better. Ready Player One does kind of like delve deeply into some pretty arcane things about video games and 1980s culture and stuff like that. And if you don't know that stuff, if mentioning a particular TV show, for example, and what those characters did, said, or whatever, if none of that appeals to you, then that could also be kind of a turnoff, you know, as a storytelling technique, because there's a fair amount of it in in Ready Player One. So you have to kind of really, you know, be into the geekiness in a way that Warcross is a little more accessible that way. Why do you think these two books are so connected in among fans? I mean, is it just that they're both for true reality? I mean, as ter- in terms of sci-fi, in terms of stories, there's a lot of books like this, a lot of stories that have similar ideas, I think. But these two are connected in people's minds and in, in how they feel about them. But I, I, I just, I think it's just the way people read. You know, if you play video games and if you like thinking about video games, then you're going to read science fiction about video games and virtual reality is the next step, right, in video games. So... I'm not sure that it's anything more than that. I was wondering if it was more than that. Now, I, now, I'm not, I, now I don't think that there is, it is more than that. I think it also, if you have to, we have to remember that on one level, we've had these stories, you know, set in virtual worlds and video game worlds and stuff like that for a while. I mean, Orson Scott Card's Ender's Game, you know, which was written in the mid 80s, right, is sort of one of the classics of that, you know, William Gibson's Neuromancer, Mm -hmm. movies like The Matrix, Mm -hmm. you know, and stuff. So we've always been kind of... The first one, not the others. (laughs) The first one, not the others, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, so, but I'd say we've, we've always then been writing about these other fantastical worlds that we spend a lot of time in. I think the bigger question is why do we like to spend so much time in such fantastical worlds. Okay, so you've read these two books. Um, oftentimes, we talk, we've talk. we talked a lot about how fiction is about, really about us, about understanding our world better, understanding our own existence, and what came before, what comes next, and just trying to deal with bigger thematic questions. Uh, you've read these two books now. Do you feel like you understand the world a little better? Is What do you feel like you've gotten out of it? Yeah, okay, so I don't think these books help 
understand a world better. I think they're a reflection, the reflection of the of some of the things that we are a part of now and are perhaps worried about, but also deeply involved in. So the worry and the deeply involved things are separate things. So like, for example, the fact that these are both set in dystopian worlds where like people are sort of living on the edge of things, that's a reflection, but it's also one of our worries, energy crisis stuff. And that leads to kind of sort of economic collapse for a lot of people in, in Ready Player One and and just a general like can't make it in the world problem of war cross. There's that, but I think that there's also then this deep, deep need to escape a little bit. And that's what video games are. That's what rich reality will be for a lot of people. So these books are just a reflection of that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to ask you the toughest question. And I know this okay. is unfair. And mm-hmm. we had, yet here it comes. And I think I know the answer. But um, which book did you personally love and you would recommend? You mean just as a reading experience? Because mm-hmm. I, I, I did want to say one other thing about Ready Player One, which I found kind of okay. intriguing, which was the fact that, you know, there's this, in the story, there's an Easter egg hunt, right? But then also... Ernest Klein did a very, very smart thing and that he created an Easter egg in the physical copies, in the paperback and in the hardback of Ready Player One. Mm-hmm. And he gave away a prize, you know, a DeLorean from 1981. Which, which is the have been, most awesome you know. prize ever. <laughs> right, right. So that was a really, really smart thing. You know, you're reading a fictional story, but then you have this real life experience that connects with it. As a reading experience, I definitely liked Warcross better. I found sometimes wading through some of the stuff in Ready Player One a little, it was just a little too thick at times with the references to stuff from the 1980s. But then, you know, and even though I lived through the 1980s and experienced a lot of that stuff, I just don't experience in that deep geek way. Mm -hmm. So the headline in the next uh, online articles, Loretta Williams eviscerates Ready Player One. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, that's not fair, because I'm not <laughs> eviscerating it. <laughs> not, not not by any... No, no, I, I think there's a lot to admire about, about Ready Player One, and there's a lot to admire about Warcross. I mean, I don't think that it's a... I don't th- I, see. I'd like. I'd rather think that there doesn't really have to be an either or. Ultimately, what do you think? Are you going to go see the movie? Oh yeah, I'll probably see the movie. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be curious to see after you've seen the movie. I will have you back and talk about maybe what's the same. What's different? What Spielberg did with the story? I think it'll be fascinating to see what you have to say about that. Okay. Okay. Until then, Loretta, as always, thank you for sharing your thoughts on the latest literature out there in the world. Okay. Thanks. All right, that's Culture Cast for this week. A call out. If you have a book you'd like Loretta to consider, let us know. You can email us through our website, culturecast.org. Click on contact. Also, remember to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. Search for Culture Cast from Chicago Radio Works. I'm Nova Safo in Chicago. Thanks for listening.